Good afternoon. My name is Steve Florman, and I am currently the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the Anoka County Historical Society. On behalf of the board and on behalf of the society, I want to welcome you to the Anoka County History Center, to the city of Anoka, to Anoka County, to our beautiful community, and thank you for being with us today. We are very, very happy to have you. Just thrilled that you could spend some time with us, and we're very excited since we have before us a room full of old car enthusiasts to share with you today the story of the old car that was manufactured right here in Anoka for a brief period of time prior to World War I. So again, on behalf of the society, uh, thank you for being here. We really appreciate you here today, and uh, we're happy to share this story with you. Sharon. Great. So I am so thrilled. I've been looking forward to doing this, um, putting this pre presentation together for all of you. Um, so like uh, Steve said, the car that was made here, right here in Anoka, was called the Virac. And its basic design was, it was more like a motorized wagon or a buckboard. Um, but it was, uh, and it could be configured in different ways, um, often used as a delivery truck. Um, there were three different <coughs> body styles that were um, offered, and I don't have all of them pictured, but, um, there was what was called an open express, a steak, and an express. The prices ranged from $825 to $1,000. Um, so there's a couple ideas of what it looks like. Um, the company uh, began, was incorporated in 1909. Um, it was uh, kind of attracted to this area by the uh, Anoka Commercial Club. And there were some people that invested in it. And uh, so they manufactured these trucks uh, from their plant right north of Anoka on Ferry Street. And, and the building is still there. It's now part of uh, Schwartzman's Metal, or which is now Alter Metal. Um, so if, if anybody wants to wander up that way, you might even find it. Um, there's a picture of the, um, uh, the company. And they... they the enterprise was short-lived. They probably, the total number that were built is unclear, but um, by 1914, there were 103 VRAC trucks registered in Minnesota. So we're not sure exactly how many. Um, but like I said, they built this VRAC entirely in their plant, um, including the engines. The, um, but it, it was short-lived. They... Uh, didn't put a lot of effort into improving their their product, and they couldn't really compete with Henry Ford's newly invented assembly line, which was in 20, uh, 1913. Um, so that was um, a com competition that they couldn't do. And then they had manufactured Ford tractors, the engines for Ford tractors for a while, which were not related to Ford Motor Company. They were a different tractor company, and there was some bad press around it because they basically stole the name. And so I think they were impacted by that as well. So eventually, though, they made uh, the little railroad speeders or inspection cars that uh, you've seen probably around on the railroads. So why is it called a veer rack? Well, it got its name from the unique way that its engine operated. So VRAC stands for Valveless Explosion Every Revolution Air Cooled. And it was, <laughs> I know, <laughs> what a mouthful. Um, it was basically um, a two-cylinder, two-cycle engine that uh, was, had big fans that cooled it. There was no um, coolant circulating through it. It was just the fans that cooled it, and it was chain driven. Um, so that the, the engine itself was developed by a man named Frank Merrill of Plainfield, New Jersey. He had early on created a car with this concept, but it didn't go anywhere. And it wasn't until he um, uh, came to Anoka and was approached by people here that um, they could start a, a company. So that's how the VRAC uh, came to be. Uh, there's a unique features of the VRAC, a 20-horsepower motor, 
uh, like I said, is air cooled. And you can look, if you look closely there at the, from the top view, there are uh, big giant fans that would blow. And the body could be configured in a variety of ways. Um, so it was uh, a, unique, a unique vehicle. And a lot of people were very excited about it. Um, it did have its problems, but. <laughs> um, so here's a, a, a testimony. I found this in the VRAC file here at the, the History Center. And it said, this truck was a miraculous invention. After picking potatoes and bunching and washing vegetables, apples and berries late into the evening, before we got this truck, we would leave home at 11.30 at night and arrive in Minneapolis around 5 a.m. to be on hand when the market opened at 6. When the VRAC arrived on the scene, it was the most welcome piece of machinery, in spite of all its shortcomings, that I can remember. Now we could sleep till 3.30 a.m. and still arrive at the market on time. <laughs> so um, it was primarily used as a delivery truck, um, like I said, and it you was used to haul furniture, laundry, and I believe these pictures might be from the Twin Cities area. Um, it was operated here in Anoka um, by the um, the L what is it J L Green Livery Service, and this photo was taken just down the street. Some of you went down by the city hall in where the dam is. That's where this picture was taken. That mill was um, interestingly uh, is right where the city hall currently is, and it was in operation from 1880 to 1933. Um, it was built in 1880 as the Lincoln Mill, then it was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1884, which some of you heard about on the ghost tour this morning. And, uh, but it was rebuilt immediately in 1885 and eventually merged with Pillsbury. So that's why it's called the Pillsbury Lincoln Mill. I thought that was an interesting picture. The man pictured in the photo is Everett Ward. Apparently he was a driver um, for this livery company. And then uh, there's another picture of uh, uh, some kind of uh, storage and transfer company. Um, uh, they were s sold at various places. I know the state of Minnesota purchased a number of these. Um, this is uh, as it was used as a mail truck down at the uh, St. Peter State Hospital in St. Peter, Minnesota. Um, even as far as Skagway, Alaska, that was used as a streetcar way up there. And uh, so if any of you have been to Skagway, that's a pretty far ways to go. And then I put this in here because I know Roy and Sharon live in Wadena or near Sabika. And uh, even up there in northern Minnesota, there was uh, a VRAC apparently that was used near the uh, mercantile company. <laughs> That's you! <laughs> uh, um, so what is my personal connection to the VRAC? Well, these are my great-grandparents, William and Laura Amy Dickinson, and their children, um, and they owned a VRAC. Um, I will point out the girl that's standing on the uh, far right there is my grandma, Grandma Grace. And many of you know that our car is named Gracie after her. Um, she was born in 1892, and she drove a 1915 Overland, which I brought a picture of here. That was the, her Overland that she drew, uh, drove. So I know this is about the VRAC, but I have to show that because we're the Overland Club. Um, she uh, drove that car while she was teaching and then later she drove a 1925 Overland as a single woman, and she would go to her different schools that she taught. The baby on my great-grandfather's lap is uh, my great-uncle Roger, Roger Dickinson. He was born in 1903, and he recalls driving the VRAC starting at age 12 uh, until he was into his 20s. So our best guess is that the VRAC was driven from around 1915 to 1925, and he would drive it to the vegetable market five times a week. Um, 
So here's a picture of the actual VRAC that my great-grandparents owned, and this was taken at their uh, home place down in Osseo, Minnesota, which is just a town not too far from Minoka, just south of us here. Um, the uh, original owner was probably, um, based on the, the license records from the state of Minnesota, was a Reverend W.F. Trussell. He bought, the, it was the serial number is 588, and it was probably built in late 1912 or 1913. We're not entirely sure. Um, and like I said, the Dickinsons drove it for a while. Um, my uncle, great uncle Roger, uh, has written a little article about his experience with the VRAC, and I thought I would just read a little excerpt from that. He says, this magnificent two-cylinder motor was air-cooled. Its greatest problem was the spark plugs getting oily. This problem stemmed from adding one quart of oil to every five gallons of gas, as you had to stir this well by stirring with a wooden paddle to prevent it from fouling the plugs. <laughs> anyway, so apparently it was a little bit of a, um, a chore to, to run this thing. He also talks about uh, the chains would break and, and uh, stuff. But he would drive this. It says, all week long, the VREC was used in the gardening business, and on Sundays, the Sunday seat was dusted off and installed in place behind the driver's seat. So you can see there's a second seat. That's, been, that's the Sunday seat. And uh, this piece of equipment didn't come with the original purchase and cost $10 extra. <laughs> yeah. The family then climbed in, taking great care not to soil the swishy skirts and white frilly blouses with the oily surfaces. <laughs> so <laughs> I can imagine my, uh, my grandma driving to church in the Virac. <laughs> um, the picture of the couple on the right there is my grandma Grace and uh, my grandpa Ignac. So, like I told you, she was uh, a teacher, school teacher as a single woman, and her last school was in Andover, right next door to my grandpa's farm. And uh, so that's how they met. They were married in 1931. Well, my great-grandfather, William Dickinson, passed away in 1936. And so we think sometime in the 1940s, my grandparents acquired the place in Osseo. Um, there had been uh, metal, um, lots of parts went for scrap, probably during the war. So there were only pieces of the Virac that were left. But my grandfather, I think recognizing the historical value of the Virac, knowing it was manufactured in Anoka, he brought the pieces to his farm in Andover. So the Virac quietly sat hidden away in the attic of the old garage <laughs> until 2012, I believe, we, or 2011, my dad passed away, and we started cleaning out all of the buildings on the farm, and there was a lot of stuff. Not only my grandfather's stuff, my dad's stuff, and just sifting through all that um, in preparation for an auction. Well, we went up to the attic of the old garage, and there we found the pieces of the Virac. I had always heard about the Virac as a child. You know, the Virac was made in Anoka, you know, and we didn't really know where it was, or, but it, there, it, there it was up in the attic in uh, amongst a bunch of debris, and uh, we uh, took all the things out of there, and uh, we, we um, took pictures of the, of the thing. Here you can see where the plate says serial number 588. And uh, this, by the way, we have pieces of this Virac sitting out back there in our little pop-up display. So you can go look at these things later. But we've, um, we kind of stored the pieces until we could figure out what we might do with them. Um, so like I said, we brought three pieces of this Virac today. We brought um, the front board. We brought the steering column, and we brought the front seat. And those are on display in the back. Um, so you can see, this is the first time these items have been brought out in public. So they've been, they've been uh, tucked away all these many years. Um, so, um, 
So in the process um, of this, we discovered there were others who had uh, an interest in the VRAC. Um, Bill Dickinson, who was um, the grandson of William Dickinson, that's Roger's son and my dad's cousin, he had a vast collection of old cars. I mean, a lot. And um, when he passed away, they had a, an auction, a huge auction. And I think Roy's son went to the auction, didn't he? He's OK. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so we went there because we thought maybe Bill still has some pieces of the Virac. We'll try to see what we can find. Um, so we didn't find much, but we did find there was a small VRAC engine, not something that was used in a truck, but something that they've used in other things, like even a washing machine or something. But there was a small VRAC engine, and um, so Kyle decided to bid on it. And uh, he was bidding against another guy. There was another guy bidding, um, and, uh, but Kyle ended up winning the bid. <laughs> Immediately, this guy comes over He says, what's your interest in the VRAC? <laughs> and uh, so we had to explain what it was. And it turns out it was Jim Roots, who, um, <laughs> yeah, Jim is on the board here at the Noka County Historical Society. And he said he was at the auction on behalf of the, of the society to track down any VRAC pieces. So we were kind of at cross purposes there. Um, but we found out that Jim had a, has a great interest and passion for the VRAC. Um, so that brings me to um, another connection. And um, it was about that same time that we found out about Steve Florman's connection to the VRAC. Um, we knew Steve from early days with 4-H, because our kids were involved with 4-H. Uh, but we ran into him again at one of the Saturday night car shows here in Anoka. And uh, somehow the topic of the VRAC came up. And I don't remember, but you were telling us about how um, there is another VRAC, and but I'm going to let Steve tell that story. Thanks, Sharon. Um, <laughs> this, this was totally out of the blue for me. Uh, I should mention that while I really enjoy old vehicles, I have nowhere near the level of interest or passion that, that you folks have. I've never restored one. Uh, my connection to old cars is that um, as a result of my family's lack of prosperity, I frequently drive them. Um, so when I go to an old car show, I'm looking for something like the 1970 Ford Galaxy 500 that I drove in high school in the early 80s. And I'll tell you, they look a lot better when they come to the car shows than they did when I was uh, a junior in high school. But um, So I, um, my dad's family pioneered Montana. Uh, in just a few years after the Custer battle, um, my great-great-grandparents in their covered wagon um, came from Missouri, crossed the plains, and ended up in the Shields River Valley in Montana. And uh, I'm just going to forward. Um, so the Shields River Valley, so south, think south central Montana. And so my dad's family has been there, you know, since 1879, 1880. And um, one of my cousins, I think she's my second cousin once removed if you're into that sort of thing. I'm the record keeper, by the way, in my dad's family, so I keep the genealogy. I'm just the guy who has all the records. 20 years ago in 2002, we went to a family reunion out there, and as we're coming back, we stopped in a little town called Big Timber. Big Timber is the county seat of Sweetgrass County, population about 1,600, 1,700. Um, between its founding and World War II, Big Timber, which is where a lot of my dad's family settled in that area, it was one of the biggest sheep shearing and wool shipping hubs in the United States. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, <laughs> the town was built in the 1870s, 1880s on the Northern Pacific Railroad. And so like a lot of Southern Montana towns on the rail lines, it is three miles long and half a mile wide. It's built along the tracks. Um, so like many frontier towns, it was originally built of wood and that's kind of where the VRAC legend starts, not necessarily the truth. Now, the records haven't been found. They probably don't exist. But the VR, VRAC was probably originally purchased either by the city of Big Timber or by Sweetgrass County as some kind of county road truck or maintenance vehicle. That's my best guess at this point. So um, you know, my family's all through this whole area. And, uh, and we're sitting down. And my cousin Barb, you know, they, she, we basically stopped in to see them on our way home. And uh, we're sitting down there. And her husband, 
um, was kind of like one of those uh, leading citizens of the city. You know the type of guy I mean, right? And he's kind of one of those guys, he's always run his own business and he's, you know, at this time he was, uh, he was probably in his 70s and they were fairly recently retired. And so he's like, oh, you come from Minoka, Minnesota, he says. It's just exactly how he talked. <laughs> you ever heard of the V-Rack? I hadn't, I'm not having Sharon's family connections. I had no idea what he was talking about. So he says, well, it was this car we you know, built in Minnesota. We got one over in the fire department. We bought us a fire truck, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. So he tells me this story. Apparently in 1908, there was a fire in Big Timber, just like our 1883 fire. It burned about a third of downtown Big Timber, which was all built of wood at the time. And so the legend is that in 1908, the city of Big Timber decided they wanted to buy a fire truck and they bought a V-Rack. Now, we know that in 1908, the V-Rack Motor Company was not even in existence. So they restored this V-Rack, it runs, it says 1908 V-Rack, which is a complete anachronism. Company didn't exist in 1908. They did not purchase this truck as a fire truck. But in 1962, 63, 64, when the derelict V-Rack was sitting out in back of City Hall in Big Timber, Montana, turning to dust as things only can turn to dust in Montana, and thank heavens it wasn't Minnesota or it would never have been restorable. That was what they thought, was that this had been their fire truck 1908, 09, you know, 1910. And so these older guys, and Art was, well, he was born in, he's, he's 95 now, so do the math. He was born in, you know, 1925 or whatever. Um, so he's in his 30s or 40s. He's running a standard station in town. They decide they're going to take this old derelict and restore it to working condition. So they pull the thing, you know, rope the thing, drag it in out of the field, and get rid of the rotten wood, the lumber, you saw the pictures. This thing is basically a buckboard with an engine in it. They clean up the metal. They dismantle the engine. They figure out how it works. They put all the pieces back together. They put in new wood. They paint it all up. And what we end up with is the Big Timber V-Rack. Uh, labeled Big Timber Volunteer Fire Department number one, 1908. Eh, thank you for playing. Uh, but that's what they thought in the early 60s when they restored it. And so they got it in working condition. Um, the Big Timber Pioneer, uh, their newspaper, has a couple pictures from when they finished the restoration in 1964. There's a much younger, much spryer art, cousin art, behind the wheel of the thing. Um, it, it ran in parades. It still runs in parades. Uh, and he told me some interesting things about the V-Rack because art is one of those rural Montana storyteller types of guys who will go on forever and you will just listen to him until the cows come home because he's that kind of storyteller. And so he's telling me all about this. He was particularly proud and I walked through the parking lot and I saw that a number of your vehicles have wooden steering wheels. The V-Rack has a one piece wooden steering wheel. It's one piece, I'm guessing it's maple, that was bent into a circle finger jointed and joined on the end. And when they dragged the thing out of the field, that finger joint was swollen, split, the steering wheel was kind of like. And the thing that Art was the most proud of was the way that he had soaked, cleaned, rebent, re-glued, clamped, dried, and finished this steering wheel. And it's beautiful. It's a one piece, perfectly circular, uniform steering wheel attached to the vehicle today. Um, and so he's telling me all about the steering wheel, which I thought would be a detail you folks would appreciate as well, uh, having wooden steering wheels on some of those vehicles, and it was really pretty neat. So this is my son, Rob. Um, let's see, this is exactly 20 years ago. Not exactly, but it'll be 20 years ago this fall. <sighs> Today is Rob's 24th birthday, so that gives you an idea. He's not quite four in that photo. Um, he's taller than me now. You, you know, these things work that way. But this is their restored V-Rack along with a trophy that they won um, at a regional parade. So um, it's sitting in the front. And, and so Art says to me, well, you want to see it? <laughs> yeah, twist my arm, right? Well, let me make a couple phone calls. So he makes a couple phone calls to the guys in the volunteer fire department. Remember, Art's kind of a big man around town, right? He's the head of local VFW. He's a local mason. He's been running a business in town for years. He makes two phone calls, and in 10 minutes, he's got the keys to the fire department. <laughs> so we walk down to the fire department because this is big timber. 
we go into the fire department, he opens it up, and that's what we see. So these pictures um, that you're gonna see are pictures that I took in 2002 when we were there. And uh, I, you know, I could go on about my family in Big Timber, Montana, and blah, 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 forever, but the fact is, you guys are old car enthusiasts, and so what you wanna see is pictures of the V-Rack, and so this is it. Uh, one of the things he told me about it is that when you start it up, and you can see on the, I don't dare point to, but you can see a crank on the front there, right? When you start it up and you get it cranked, it's got a forward gear and a reverse gear. And you don't know which way the car is gonna go until you actually accelerate. So it doesn't matter which way the lever is, right? All the lever does is change the direction. So if you start it up and you put the pedal down and it starts to move backwards, then you move the lever into whichever position it's not, and then it goes forwards. So you just can't tell until you, you know, and it's, it kind of has to do with the way, you know, the pistons move around the cylinder. If they go this way at first, it goes forward. If they go this way at first, it goes backwards. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. You never know which way it's gonna go when you start it. So <laughs> there you go. So in 2019, we, um, oh, there are absolutely more pictures. So this is, the, this is the motor from the front. You can see these fan blades around the thing. It's, as, as Sharon mentioned, it's air-cooled, and the air cooling was partially facilitated by fan blades that were attached to the flywheel, and you can see them you know, around the bottom there. I got down and you know, took a picture underneath it. Um, that's a picture of the cockpit. So, there's your brake lever and your accelerator. There is Art's steering wheel. <laughs> and there is your gear shift lever. Forward and reverse, or reverse and forward, depending on which way she goes when you first start it up. So I <laughs> just thought that was kind of interesting. This is probably an older model. Um, the first one rolled off the line in November of 1910. By 1915, they were out of business. So that gives you an idea. I think Sharon's Families is probably one of the later models, judging both by the serial number and by its design. Um, we're, we're just guessing that based on the, the pictures we have. We sold, what was it, 100 some odd of them were registered in Minnesota. If you look at newspaper accounts of the time and just search on VRAC, you'll find hits on purchased VRACs all over the Midwest. There were a couple in Nebraska, a couple in North Dakota, a couple in Iowa, a couple in Illinois. I mean, just ones and twos around the Midwest, these trucks were sold out here. In Anoka County, there was one story that the thing was so, uh, did so well on sand that it was a great truck for rural Anoka County, which is mostly sand. When I was a kid, you know, it was hard bicycling out here because you were basically trying to bike in sugar sand. Locals will remember how terrible that was. So. Apparently it was good for that if for nothing else. Uh, I tried to get some contrast on this. This is the back. They have a modern battery in the thing, you know, to kind of get it started. But this is the back looking forward at the back of the front seat. Um, they keep a barrel in it kind of on the fire department theme, et cetera. Um, and then there's that front quarter picture again with little Rob. Um, but that gives you an idea of kind of the layout. They, of course, put stakes on the side and hung a ladder on there all in the fire department theme, um, which it isn't. Um, front view, um, originally there would have been, a, a, the board on the front would have had the VRAC logo, logo of course. Um, it doesn't in this example probably because it had all worn away when they started the restoration. And then that's kind of a rear quarter view that gives you an idea of what the thing looks like. The bell of course is a later addition as well. Oh, yeah. like a kitten. Okay, so it's, um, it's kind of interesting because I had no idea this thing existed, much less that it was running. So I came back with all these photos and I walk into the Historical Society. This is long before my involvement with the board and I said, Tell me about the V-Rack. And they said, well, we have part of an engine block. They used to build them here in Minnesota. I said, would it interest you to know that there's a fully functional restored V-Rack in Big Timber, Minnesota? And you would have thought I had just said, 
would it interest you to know where they're hiding the Lindbergh baby or something like that, right? I mean, they looked at me like. So I dropped off all the pictures and wrote out the whole story and so on. And then a few years later, this guy comes to the board and he's all excited about the VRAC and blueprints and these things. And he wants to bring the Montana VRAC to Minnesota to the now then threshing show. And I'm like, oh yeah, my cousin helped restore that in the 60s. And he looked at me like, what? You guys know about this? Oh yeah. So I'm all nonchalant about it. He's like, I thought you were pulling my leg. No, I'm serious. You know, we, so anyway, that's it. There's one running. 2019, it made an appearance at the threshing show. Yep. There we are. We have some photos from that event. Um, so the Big Timber VRAC came to Minnesota in 2019. <laughs> you were there too, right? I was. Yes, a lot of us were. Um, so it was really cool to see this thing in person. It's the only known running VRAC around. I mean, we don't know of any others. Um, so the people pictured here uh, is the Novotny family, right? The, it's his son and his dad. They are volunteers with the fire department, I believe, or they, they work with the fire department. And the other gentleman um, was just someone who kind of helps them um, run the thing in the parade. So that picture on the far right is at the Nowthen Threshing Show in the Parade of Power, which some of you are going to participate in uh, with your cars on Friday. Um, there's some photos of the engine itself, and then you can see underneath there, it's a chain-driven uh, thing, and then you can see the sprocket and the chain going around there. Um, so that brings me to another person I got in touch with, um, Jim Roots, who I mentioned we met at the auction. He put me in touch with Rich Oxley, who teaches at Hennepin Technical College, and he is currently the president of the Anoka County Historical Society Board. Um, I had a delightful phone conversation with Rich um, a few weeks ago, and he agreed to come and share a little bit about what's happening at and up in technical college, and maybe could we rebuild a VRAC? Is it possible? So I will let Rich tell the story of what they're doing over there. <laughs> yep, the video's going by itself. Uh, <laughs> well, hey, I would like to, as uh, Steve mentioned, we would like to welcome you to the Anoka County Historical Society History Center. And a lot of things happen here, a lot of things happen on our board. Some of them actually good. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> this was one of them. And I think I was in the room when Steve was talking about the big timber thing. And my mouth was agape. Okay, so it's like, wait a minute, we built something along the beginnings of automobile manufacturing right here in Anoka, Minnesota, are you kidding me? It's crazy. Well, then we found out that the foundry, part of the foundry is still in existence. And I'm a documentarian, and so I kind of said, okay, documentary, right? And that's where it would start. So I want to change direction just a little bit. And what I mean by that is what's next for a particular project that we're working on with the VRAC. There are several of us on the board that are just enamored by the thing, and there are several of us on the board that could care less what VRAC is, right? <laughs> but we have, we've got a task force, and for the last several years, and I told Sharon this, we've been kind of going, well, this way, this way, this way, this way. What are we doing? We, maybe a campaign, hey, they're bringing it to the Now Then Threshing Show. Hey, that's, that's cool. What we want is we want one. Right? We want one here, right there, right? And uh, so people can see it. So it's a pretty amazing story. And when you talk to people, when we're, Steve and I are at the River Fest or whatever, and we say, did you know? And we talk to people, young folks, older folks, did you know that we built an automobile here in Anoka? And they kind of go, what? What are you talking about? And of course, it's the VRAC. I came across a picture that I found just fascinating, which was, a group of gentlemen, workers, in front, uh, they were on uh, railroad cars, yep. and in behind there was the 
the outside of the building, it said VRAC, Anoka, Minnesota, and it was and six, maybe six or seven folks on that picture, and I was just blown away by that picture. That moment in time, because the railroad tracks are right there, and then the foundry is right behind it. It's amazing. So Steve and I, when we talk about VRAC, we find out something, he, I usually find out something that I didn't know. And today I found out something I didn't know, uh, you know, about the chair that's over there, so make sure you get a chance to look at that, uh, which is fascinating. And it had white walls, right, way back when. They were trendsetters. Before they were cool. <laughs> Before they, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, so what are we doing now? So one of the things that we said is, hey, could we build a VRAC? And we kicked it around and said, okay, you know, 3D printing is really happening now. It's prevalent. Uh, in fact, people are printing stuff in their living rooms, right? That's how prevalent it's become. So we kind of kicked around the idea, what would it take? What could we do with it? So we have a project that we put together that said, okay, if we wanted to do this, how would we do it? So we're going to co collaborate with the engineering CAD department at Hennepin Technical College. I happen to know the instructor personally because I work there. <laughs> so... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a video production instructor at Hennepin Tech. And I got Rick Monska involved. And he was, uh, I needed to, for him to fall in love with this project. So I started telling him about the history. And I, he started to fall in love. We want to convert archive sketches, and I have some that we have, and, and drawings into CAD, which is computer-aided uh, design. Thank you. Uh, a format for 3D printing, and then create a 3D printed Tonka truck, right? And um, prototype for display and educational purposes. So when Steve and I are at some sort of now then his, his heritage festival or Riverfest or wherever, if we had that thing sitting there, it's a conversation piece. And once we get them talking, then we say, hey, by the way, we got ghost tours, and by the way, you should go see our history center, and by the way, we're presentation guys. We like to present. We like to tell people what we think we know. Um, <laughs> so here's an example of some of these sketches, right? So back in the day, you had engineers that sketched. And I'm not talking about what they do today. They were literally, if they had a ruler every once in a while, that was a good thing, right? So they're literally sketching. There's handwritten notes on them and they're really, really fine. You can barely see them. So poor Rick at the college, who's going to take a look at these things, had to deal with these. And in a, on a rare occasion, we had an actual blueprint. So what are we going to do? We're going to take these drawings and sketches, and we're going to turn them into 3D type of modeling, and then we're going to 3D print, right? So how are we going to do this? The thing is, I mean, we've got a lot of moving parts there. How are we going to do the transmission? How are we going to do the engine? How are we going to do the, the, the uh, payload, the steering wheel, all of those things? So he's in a search. So what I convinced him to do is take one of your drawing classes, your CAD drawing classes, and get them 3D printing ready. So he let, spent last semester with his students, okay? creating some of these drawings, which was fascinating. And what the story, and that's just another example. It's, these, aren't pr these aren't parts, by the way, of VRAC. It's just an example. But here's the story for the documentary. The students had to turn into sleuths. They had to figure this thing out. What is this part, and where does it belong? And what does it do? And, to, and then extrude it into a 3D rendering now what do we do? So be, without us knowing it, they turn into historians. And that's part of this project that's pretty amazing to me, which is part of this uh, documentary we want to do. These are just examples of what we want to do. We want to be able to build, and Rebecca, uh, who is our executive director here, said, what if we built just a bunch of parts and then a high school group had to physically put them together to make it happen, right? That would be a learning um, uh, 
situation. So here's an a couple of examples of cars that you could use. And so what we want to do is we want to have a V-Rack eventually sitting there, and we can print as many as we want, but we want to change the, the top of it, you know, fire truck, laundry, whatever. We want to be able to change it out so you can show some of the uses for the V-Rack. So that's a story that's still ongoing. We spent an entire spring semester, and I have something here. Okay, so this is uh, something that my nephew, who does 3D printing, what this is, it's plastic, but he printed it. He printed this in his living room. And I'm fascinated, I'm going, well, what do you mean you printed it? Yeah, so he had the drawings, he had the renderings, he had the ability and the materials to do it, and he was able to print this. So what this is, is this sticks on the side of your Traeger uh, grill, and you can tell which pellets you have in there. And he gave it to me, and I said, hey, that's pretty fascinating. So every one of these things is printed 3D. So something 10 years ago was inconceivable, now is conceivable. Now we can do this sort of thing. So that's where we want to go with it. Now, do we want to create an actual 3D printed life-size version? Sure, let's do that. <laughs> it's not without cost. Uh, but um, the, the other thing is, too, is it going to be working? I mean, to get the thing, uh, to, to do what we'd want to do with it, let's just start small with the Tonka truck, shall we? Uh, and I think that's going to be a nice conversation piece then you can bring it, it's portable. Uh, somebody like Sarah can actually bring it somewhere. <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, I would like to thank you all. That's uh, pretty much all I have for the presentation, but I can tell you the conversations that we've had is such an exciting thing. Uh, we're excited about it. Oh. Some, sometimes. <laughs> I, I envision a, like a Lego truck. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, and so it's gonna prompt a lot of questions and a lot of presentation, and that's what we wanna do. Oh, and then the next part, a documentary. We eventually want to tell this story. We want to tell a story so people can see what happened in Anoka, Minnesota. Um, and um, I've done some documentaries before, and one of the things that I'm really into is telling little known stories, not just stories about the first Minnesota. I'd rather do the second Minnesota or the ninth Minnesota, um, because the first Minnesota has been done. Uh, and so this is a story that hasn't been done yet. And this is like the first presentation that Steve and I have ever heard of about the VRAC. We're making history, you guys, yeah. at the History Center for the Anoka County Historical Society. Yeah. So I, again, I want to thank you very much for, for uh, having us today. All Thanks. Right. Thank you. So, <laughs> so I just want to acknowledge the people who have helped make this presentation possible. First, Jim Roots, who was unable to be here. His, his wife is not well. Um, but I, I thank Jim for his boundless enthusiasm and connecting me to, be, uh, with, to others who are passionate about the VRAC. Um, and then, of course, Rich, thank you so much for your desire to preserve Anoka history and giving us a glimpse of where we might take this in the future. Thank you, Steve, for your personal connection to this story with the Big Timber VRAC. And thank you, Sarah. She's back there. Thank you, Sarah, for pulling out files and items from the archives and for facilitating this presentation. Um, and thank you to Don. Is Don in the room? Where did Don go? Oh, Don is outside. Um, thank you to Don for his countless hours that he has devoted to digitizing all of those VRAC blueprints and memorabilia. It's his station right here, and he, he works magic with his camera. And in fact, uh, after, the dis, um, after the presentation, walk over and see some of the actual blueprints and drawings that uh, we've mentioned. And finally, I want to say thank you to my Aunt Laura, who is here today, for being a resource regarding the Dickinson family's involvement with the VRAC. So it was her grandfather who owned the VRAC, and her mother is Grace. So those of you who are familiar with my, our car, Gracie, and thank you so much for coming. This was something I've been looking forward to for weeks, so I'm so glad to share it with you.